Welcome to Digital Democracy on Tap. I'm Sarah Jane Crespo. Are challenges just opportunities in disguise? Maybe sometimes. How about now as the pandemic drags on? Well, tonight we have a savvy panel here to discuss our financial state and some possibilities for how you can cope. Let's meet our panel. Tracy Adams, president and founder of Hawthorne Capital LLC. Sue Tiraconda, CFP at Cordell Wealth Management and Jeff Witherspoon, Executive Director of Wichita's Consumer Credit Counseling Service. Welcome to all of you. Thanks Over, the next, Over the next hour, please send us questions through Facebook, or you can email us right now at info at kmuw.org. So let's break down the challenges that Americans and specifically Kansans are facing right now. I wonder if specific generations, millennials versus baby boomers, for example, are really looking at different issues at the moment. Jeff, will you kick us off? Yeah, I'd be happy to. It's uh, been a very interesting year and a half when COVID hit. Um, things were doing very well financially. Unemployment was down. Um, and then everything changed on a dime. COVID hit. Um, we all had to really scramble to figure out what was going on and how to address some of the issues. Um, people were um, really scared and, and justifiably so. They were worried about going to work. A lot of people um, changed jobs. And um, it's been very, very interesting to say the least. That people's attitudes are really different. And it seemed like everything that I thought would happen didn't happen. And it's, it's become almost oppositely. And now that um, we're here a year and a half later, um, we're still seeing people um, approaching things differently. They're considering changing careers, working from home now. Um, who would ever thought we'd be doing most things by Zoom? Um, it's just, it's, it's different. And um, it's a different mindset for a lot of folks, but there've been a lot of positives as well. I've seen credit card debt actually go down, um, which I had not anticipated, um, which is a smart financial move. Um, so I think the next year, year and a half are definitely um, going to be interesting um, in, the, in the regards to finance because we're seeing housing going through the roof for prices, cars going through the roof for prices. Um, interest rates have stayed, stayed very, very low. Um, so I'd like to hear what the other panelists would, would like to say about the last year, year before, and a half. Yeah, before we pass it on to the other panelists, I'm curious, you mentioned the credit card debt going down and that surprised you, but now looking back at that having happened, can you explain it? Yeah, we're very conservative here in the Midwest. And what a lot of people did with their stimulus money is they paid down debt, which, you know, if they didn't need to, to build up their emergency funds, I was very proud to see and, and happy to see because by paying down the debt, um, it helps them out in the long term financially because they're not as trapped. Um, so it was a good thing. Hmm. Okay, how about you guys, Tracy and Sue, would you like to respond to that question? Uh, millennials versus baby boomers, just the, the concept yeah. of different generations having to worry about different things. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's a great thing. I mean, when you look at what happened with the pandemic, people had vastly different experiences depending on where they were at in life, right? So you had folks that were, that were much older that maybe had more savings um, that they could rely on. Um, I have found that a lot of baby boomers now have become much more concerned about long-term care issues, um, about making sure that they have things like powers of attorneys in case they were to get ill and, and have to be hospitalized and need that. Um, so there became much more of an importance placed on some of those types of things that you normally wouldn't think about. Um, on the flip side, for millennials, it almost became you know, a budgeting issue, right? So for many millennials, um, particularly if they didn't have adequate emergency uh, savings and stuff built up, uh, they found themselves in a much more difficult situation of how do we pay for rent? Um, you know, how do we take care of childcare? Um, they found themselves having to maybe homeschool their kids um, and they hadn't before. So I think that depending on where you were in life, you experience the pandemic very, very differently. Yeah, so, and I would agree with you. 
And in our experience, when we were working with millennials, it was more about reducing our debt and reducing our you know, outflows and making some tweaks. And we did a lot of work with budgeting and realizing you know, the way that we had been living or they had been living prior to uh, the pandemic revealed some errors. And I find that our millennials are very financial, financially conscious. They may not be as savvy, but they're very conscious of finances. Whereas baby boomers, we were doing more of the estate planning kinds of things and making sure of our documents and paperwork were all in, in place. So it was three different kinds of conversations, really. Hmm. So how should people adapt to financial changes due to COVID? Um, what do you think is the first order of business, Tracy? I always say take a, a picture. You know, this is an opportunity for us to snap, stop and take a snapshot of where we are. And then we can start operating, start doing tweaks there, but we have to be able to take a picture. And a lot of times when we're living as we were pre-pandemic, we weren't taking time to pay attention to the details, but I feel like the pandemic allowed us the opportunity to stop and be able to take a picture, a snapshot of our financial condition positions where we are, and we can make tweaks and be able to build ourselves out of that. But we had to take time to stop and really look at where we were. So when you talk about taking a picture, does that entail, you know, a month of your expenditures plus, you know, what you, what's coming in, what's going out for a month? And like, what, what all does it involve? We like to see six months of, of financials, but taking a, a six month snapshot, if you will, backward looking on where our money was going for the last six months and savings and where we're participating in those kinds of vehicles as well. So we start there and then we start to build ourselves out of it. But we like to look six months behind. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Sue, would you summarize for us what rising interest rates would mean for the average American? Is that what we're seeing now? What are we seeing and what does it mean in, in the home uh, for the average American? Great question. Um, so actually, interest rates have been low for a very long time. One of the benefits of that has been the housing boom, right? So when interest rates are low, you can afford more home uh, because your payments are lower. So as interest rates rise, it is going to get harder for those that have a lot of debt. Um, so if you think about from a, from a saver's perspective, rising interest rates are fantastic because what have we been making on our bank deposits next to nothing, right? So as interest rates rise, if you're a saver, you're able to generate a little bit better interest rate, right? Um, on the flip side, if you are someone that has carried a lot of debt, maybe you have a lot of credit card debt, uh, a rising interest rate environment is gonna be difficult for you because now those payments are gonna go up. Um, one of the things that got us in trouble from a housing perspective before was, be, was that a lot of Americans actually took out adjustable rate mortgages. So when interest rates started to rise, their payments, their monthly payments went up along with that. And suddenly what was affordable became unaffordable, right? So making sure that you have a fixed rate mortgage so that you are immune uh, to rising interest rates, at least for that big purchase of a home um, and even a car is very important because it allows you to ride through some of those economic periods without having that type of, of catastrophic thing happen to you where suddenly you can't make your payments anymore. Mm. Um, now I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say from an investment perspective, rising interest rates actually can be positive mm. um, because what that does is it allows people to feel more comfortable going into the market and actually investing because they're not making money in the bank. Um, so it does have a positive impact on folks that maybe might entice them to invest a little bit more rather than keeping it in the bank. Uh, that's very interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, that it's, it's sort of the other side of the coin, that there is this positive side as well as a negative. But so it, it, are interest rates starting to turn now? Because I remember when they just fell out the bottom when COVID was really um, getting entrenched in our country. Um, is it turning now or is it staying pretty low? And does that, do, can you foresee that that might continue or not? Well, for, for now, it is staying pretty low. Um, the Federal Reserve 
really does set interest rates. So they determine kind of the, the upward or downward path of interest rates. And at this point, the Federal Reserve has basically said that they're gonna leave rates at where they're at. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that we've all, we've probably read articles about inflation kicking up, right? And that's one of the things that the Federal Reserve looks at. So if we start to see a long period of high inflation, that may cause the Federal Reserve to take a look at that and potentially raise interest rates. Um, but at this point, for the short term, uh, they are holding rates at where they're at. That's a really great segue. I wanted to talk about inflation next, <laughs> actually. Sure. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> and maybe we <laughs> want to come back to you on that as well. But Jeff, I wanted to come to you on that note and just sort of follow up with how, how inflation impacts most people. Um, in what ways does it, it impact them the most? And how are you helping people through that with your organization? Well, I, I work for a nonprofit agency that tries to help people develop their budgets and give them ideas on spending their money more wisely, finding tips um, that can help them figure things out on day to day expenses, plus to address their debt issues. Um, with inflation going up, we're going to see interest rates go up, um, I think probably sooner or later. But Sue's right, the Fed, Fed dictates that and it's their job to make sure everything's kind of on an even keel. Um, one thing that I worry about is the lower income people that we're seeing, if their incomes aren't going up and a lot of them are retired, they're on fixed income, that means the normal prices um, for goods and services, food, rent. And that's one thing I wanted to address. One thing that I'm seeing with housing prices going up so much, rent is going up too. And it's, it's, it's more and more difficult for the, the lower income folks to be able to afford their rent. Um, and I was kind of shocked to see how quickly it, it, it followed suit, but it, it makes sense because if people can't afford housing, um, it, it, the rent is gonna go up as well. So we're trying just to figure things out. That's what we do here is just to run the numbers. Um, I don't like to use the word budget because people don't like it. So I call it their spending plans. So how much money's coming in, how much money is going out. Um, it's not as intimidating when we talk about their spending plan. And then we just try to find ways that they can find enough money um, to make ends meet. And I have always said to keep the roof over the head, food and mouth utilities on. One thing that I've seen here very recently is there is a lot of people out there that are trying to get rent assistance that actually do not qualify because you have to prove that COVID was the reason um, that you couldn't pay your rent. And I'm starting to hear a lot of desperate phone calls from people that are gonna be evicted. Um, there's a misnomer out there that eviction can't happen. Um, that's not true here in Wichita. They're, they are allowing evictions. So um, you need to be as proactive as you can if you're behind on your rent um, to try to address it. So maybe um, the landlord will work out a payment arrangement so you can stay in your, in your property. And that's one of the things we do here is we try to help with rent assistance. Um, we don't give money out, but we definitely try to figure out um, what the situation is. So with the inflation going up, you're probably going to see, you know, a lot of things going up in price here very soon. They already have. Um, and I, I'm afraid with higher inflation, things might even be worse, especially the priorities like rent, like I said, but transportation costs as well. We've already seen gasoline go up tremendously, you know, just in the last six, eight months. So anyway, inflation really hurts. I mean, it's good in some respects, but it definitely can hurt on the back end. Hmm. Absolutely. You know, Jeff, you touched on a really good point. The, the things that are, that are the key drivers of inflation right now are the things that impact lower income and middle income folks the most. So, you know, gasoline and transportation costs, utilities, um, you know, used cars. So if you need to get to work, you know, the, the cost for a used car has just gone up tremendously. So it really is hurting lower income and middle income folks the hardest right now. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Um, on a recent episode of Planet Money, uh, they talk about the lack of new housing, and this was something that you guys mentioned a moment ago, um, but they talk about it as another challenge of our time, um, although the origins of this predate COVID. Um, let's listen to this clip, and then Tracy, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the other side of it. Now, in a healthy housing market, you'd have about six months of housing supply. But according to a report last month from Harvard, there's currently less than 
two months of housing supply in the U.S., which is very, very tight by historic standards. We are talking record low inventory. There are just over a million homes for sale, which is 3.8 million homes short of what we need to meet demand. So Tracy, given this sort of seller's market that we have right now, what advice would you give for people who are looking to buy a home? Well, I have been telling people though, the rates are really low and the opportunity for uh, easy money is out there for those that qualify. But I have been always reminding people of 2008. And so though the rates may be low and sometimes we're finding that because of the the short inventory folks are overbuying and in five or six years, they're gonna still be underwater. So it's not necessarily the best financial move to go in and give you the, high, the highest bid or offer more than what the house is being sold for because you can, it's not, you know, it's just not prudent to be able to go in and pay too much for property and you won't be able to get out of it. So even though it seems easy to get in and you're, and I know we have a low inventory, but think five to six years and seven years from now, are you going to be able to get out of the property? Also the competitiveness of it though, right? That, you know, it's easy to get in, but that's if you happen to uh, get your offer in first or, or whatever with just that shortage. Um, I mean, I don't know what, like where this is headed. Do you, is this something that, that any of you can kind of foresee that what are we going to do if we need more, more homes for people and they aren't there? I, I think the law of supply and demand always follows. It just gets delayed. And I think part of what we're seeing right now is a delay in the supply. So certainly there are new homes that are that are being built, but it takes time for those mm -hmm. to you know be completed. Um, and at the same time, I think people have to look at what they what they really need in a home, right? Um, and make sure that they're smart about um, to to Tracy's point, budget and make sure that they can afford it. And that, you know, maybe six, seven years or, you know, 10 years down the road, if they do want to sell it, are, are we going to get that money back out of it? Right. Um, so I think you have to think about that. And, you know, I, I have read articles that it is starting to cool a little bit, um, that some of this big push to buy a new home was because felt people felt that they were going to continue to work remote and they wanted the space and they wanted to be able to, you know, continue to have that home lifestyle. And, you know, that's a bias that we have. It's called recency bias. And what happens is that we think that what our life is like right now is going to be what our life is going to continue to be like. So we don't, we don't recognize that life can change. And so we have to kind of check ourselves and realize that, you know, yes, we may be getting into this home today and this home is perfect for us today. But 10 years from now, when the kids have all moved out, do you still want to clean this five bedroom house, right? So, you know, it's that type of thing that sometimes you've got to look at it from the long term and not just the short term to say, you know, yeah, this may help us in the short term, but is this the right decision for us in the long term? But when COVID feels like it's taking forever. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, hard <laughs> to I know. ask this. I know. Is this our I life know. now with the, the way it is? I know. And when the kids yeah. are screaming because they're fighting because they don't have their own rooms or, you know, yeah. all of those things, it, it can feel like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But, you know, COVID, we've been in COVID not even a good two years. And um, my coaching is to, uh, and, and, to envision a five and six year post COVID life and plan for that. Because, you know, COVID came up on us, shortage of 30 days somewhat. And it's like, we've been in this bubble so long, but it has not even been a good two years. And we have to think post COVID, at least five, six, seven years down the road. Hmm. Well, that um, kind of helps me segue into the, the next area, which is, um, kind of a current economic outlook for Kansas specifically. Um, would you maybe, Tracy, if you want to start with this, um, kind of give us a glimpse of where it looks like our state is headed um, in the next five, six years? 
I'm going to pass that one to Sue because I really don't have the answer for that one. <laughs> Go ahead, Sue. Sure, sure. I actually looked at, you know, we're very fortunate in Wichita. We have Wichita State University's Center for Economic Development and Business Research, and they put out a lot of data and statistics about our state. One of the things that I'll tell you that's very positive, if you look at unemployment levels from like the peak of COVID, it was upwards of 14%. But if you look at where it's at now, it's at a much more normal rate of about 3.2%. So the unemployment rate has dropped considerably, right? So many more of us have gone back to work. Um, things are returning to some measure of normalcy. Um, which I think is great. The other thing that I found interesting, and I love the name of it, it's called the misery index, right? And so what the misery index measures is kind of the impact of changing economic conditions on our, on our population. And so they take a number of different factors and they pull them together. So what is housing doing? What is the consumer price index or inflation doing? Um, and what are the employment rates? And so if you look at the misery index and you compare us to the rest of the country nationally, our misery index is substantially less than the rest of the country. So I know that we sometimes like to complain about Wichita or Kansas, but from an economic perspective, we're, we're actually doing better than the overall country is. So that's good news. And so I'd, like to, start. I'd like to add to that. One thing that we're very fortunate in, Sue's exactly right, we do put down Kansas quite a bit, which I've never quite understood. Um, maybe there's not a whole lot of cool mountains and oceans, but our cost of living is so much lower than the rest of the country. So we don't seem to struggle as much when things do get tough economically. Um, I see a lot of positives. Like she, Sue said, the unemployment rate in Kansas is very, very low. Um, employers are just begging for help. Um, and we were talking about housing. It's kind of um, ironic. I literally just moved into a brand new house um, this past weekend. Um, and the cost of building the house went up quite a bit. And the main reason was we couldn't find somebody to do the jobs. Um, there's not enough people in the trades right now um, if you are willing to, to get out and work hard um, and, and get into construction, uh, be a plumber, electrician, you can make some really, really good money. Perfect example, the gentleman that um, laid the bricks at my house, um, he charges per brick and he charged me $1,800 for one day's work. And I'm thinking I'm in the wrong business because if I knew how to do it, I would have done that for $1,800 for one day. <laughs> I did the math and that's over $90,000 a year. You could work one day <laughs> a week and, and make $90,000 a year. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of positives for Kansas. Like I said, we don't set, tend to have the really extremes that they do in the rest of the country. Part of it is because we are so conservative. Um, and I highly encourage people, maybe you have to change careers, but you can make a really good living in this state and wages are, and for years they were very stagnant. I'm starting to see the opposite to where wages are starting to go up because there aren't people to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, I think that's very, very positive. Well, and we just need to start promoting and marketing Kansas as a place to move to for its low misery index. Just, you know, <laughs> that way. That way. Is that my <laughs> Look at us. We have a that's really our new slogan. They it's not miserable <laughs> Well, okay, but something that both of you, uh, Sue and Jeff, just mentioned about the, the low unemployment rates, but then also employers are begging for workers. Help me understand, help me reconcile those two facts. That's yeah. a million dollar, that is a million dollar question. We as employers uh, can't figure out what happened. Um, huh. For some reason, people chose that maybe they don't want to do some of those jobs and I hate to say it, but I think in the future, we're gonna see artificial intelligence start taking over jobs because they can't find workers. Um, they can maybe program the computer to do it. I saw today that Amazon is looking to hire over 100,000 people. Um, that's a lot of people and we just opened up our warehouse here. What is it gonna to take to get people to go back to work? To me, that's the million dollar question and I don't have the answer, I just don't. Yeah. But we need them to go back to work, but 
a lot of them have gone back to work. So it's just about the industries or like they've gone back to other kinds of jobs. I so think a lot of folks that have that maybe used to work in the hospitality industry didn't want to take the risk, learned their lesson that, oh my gosh, if my job could be gone and I could be out of work for six to eight months, you know, think about what that does to you psychologically and your desire to go back to an industry like that. Um, I do think there have been people that have changed industries. I think too, though, that if you look at the, the socioeconomic fabric of our city, some things have changed too. So, you know, we're not completely past COVID yet. So there may still be folks that either they themselves have health issues or they have children or family members that they have to take care of. Um, so there is some of that as well that I think we're not measuring when we look at the unemployment rate. Because if you keep in mind, the unemployment rate only measures those that are actively looking. Well, what if you have completely gone out of the workforce? Um, and there is that huge component that may have just completely left the workforce that for whatever reason cannot come back. Um, you know, whether it's taking care of elderly parents or taking care of themselves because of their own health issues or their children. So I think there are some other factors at play here that are outside of just economics that are causing people to not be able to come back to work. I would agree with Sue and John that um, our high unemployment numbers don't necessarily reflect all the variables that come into play. And childcare is one of them, but I think many of them have transitioned out of some of the sectors that they were in before. And I would agree with you, Sarah, that I do think it is definitely industry specific or sector specific mm -hmm. that where we have these big gaps. Mm. Well, and, and the other issue is the extent of benefits just ended last week. So it'll be interesting Correct. to see when those people have lost that additional $300 a week, how many of those people will now feel the pressure to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For those just joining us, I'm Sarah Jane Crespo with KMUW, and this is Digital Democracy on Tap. We're talking about financial planning and the COVID economy with Tracy Adams, president and founder of Hawthorne Capital LLC, Sue Tirankanda, CFP at Cordell Wealth Management, and Jeff Witherspoon, executive director of Wichita's Consumer Credit Counseling Service. You can join the conversation through questions on Facebook or email them to info at kmuw.org. Um, I read an article about a woman who became financially independent in her mid thirties, who recommended that people not just save, but they invest. Um, but with the stock market swings that we see, how do we get started investing? What do you think? Uh, Sue, do you wanna start that one? Sure, sure. I think it's, it's very, very important, particularly for young people to start investing. Uh, some of the best ways to do that is through your workplace retirement plan um, because it allows you to put money in uh, every paycheck. You don't even know that it's gone. Uh, so you're not tempted to take it out. Um, and that money grows over time. One of the best ways to be ready for retirement is to allow the power of compounding to work for you. So, you know, there's, I don't have the numbers in my head, but if you, if a person started at 25 and started investing in the stock market, they will earn over their lifetime, uh, I think it's like 30% more than the person that waited 10 years to start investing that same amount. So it is absolutely uh, important that young people start investing early. And, you know, I think oftentimes when, when we see the stock market, it's up today, it's down tomorrow. You know, we hear a lot about volatility in the market and that scares a lot of people from investing because they think, oh my goodness, I'm going to put money in and then I'm going to lose it all. Right. And, and I'm scared to lose money. Um, so when you invest on a regular basis, so pick an amount that you're comfortable investing and put it in every month. Um, and what happens when you do that is that you take advantage of the ups and downs in the market. So when the market is high, you buy fewer shares of that particular investment. When the market is low, you buy more shares of that investment. We call that dollar cost averaging. 
And over time, it's a wonderful way to invest because you're paying an average price rather than the highest or the lowest. Um, it's really, really difficult to time the market. In other words, wait for it to drop so that you can start investing. Um, you know, putting money in over the long term in a planned strategic way is a really good way to become financially independent. Mm -hmm. um, and would you explain, uh, or Tracy, I saw you grin when I asked this question. So if you wanna jump in at this point too, um, what index funds are, that's something that I've heard about as well as maybe being a good place to start. Well, index funds are uh, a group of stocks that are on a particular index and there are all kinds of indexes. So I won't go into all them. The most common one I would say is the S&P 500. You hear that on the, on the news a lot. So it's a, it's a group or a pool of stocks that are listed on that particular index. And so when you say you're buying the S&P 500, you're gonna buy all of the stocks. And what am I saying? 500. Um, that you're going to own in one particular body. And you this is what we call passive investing. And so you buy it and you hold it. And so that's one of um, Warren Buffett's favorite um, instructions is to buy your whatever you're going to buy and put on the shelf and let it just ride. So it's called passive and that's index uh, investing. Hmm. Uh, why, the, why I, the way I smiled is that uh, when you said that with the, all of the swings that we have in the market now, well, I always spend a lot of time educating first time investors on the fact that the market is never linear. So whether we're talking about COVID or we're talking about the recession or we're talking about Black Monday or we're talking about 9-11 or we're talking, there's always going to be events in the market that are going to cause shifts and turns in the market. It doesn't matter if Jer Jerome Powell is talking today. The market is not linear, but over a period of 12 or uh, say 10 years, the market or S&P has always returned about 13.6%. And so that's better than what you can get over an average on a CD or under your mattress or in a, a jar of money. So I always say education is first important, but on, but on the front end, always letting people know the market is never linear, whether we're talking about COVID or 9-11. Hmm. We get this impression of the importance of it, though, with, you know, on Marketplace, that like happy music and the sad music. And uh, <laughs> I think it, it skews the feeling of importance for some people. Myself. <laughs> can, um, can I get my two cents on this? Absolutely. Yes, Jeff. But believe it or not, I'm almost 61 and I started my retirement at age 20 and I've been dollar cost averaging and knock wood. That's why I'm able to retire earlier than most because I just kept putting the money, I paid myself first. And so I just put it in and didn't touch it and compounding over years and years and uh, putting in the max that I could and always getting my employer match and my wife as well. I've gotten to a very good place. Um, it's, it's not, it does take a lot of discipline. I will give you that. And I'm not gonna lie after 9-11, I was really kind of panicked because if those of us to remember what the stock market did after that, it, it tanked for days and days and days, and I didn't know what was gonna happen, but look at where we're at now. I think it was down to what, 7,000, 8,000 after 9-11, and we're at what, 35,000 now? So it's gone up over four times. So you, you've gotta have a lot of discipline, and it is hard to do, um, but you, you'll get there if you, if you stay the course, and Tracy's exactly right. It's not linear, it goes up and down all the time, and you'll have times where it goes down and you kind of think you're gonna panic, but you just kind of stay the course and just keep putting money in, like Sue said. So then you're buying when it's lower. Um, so it averages over time. So that's exactly the strategy I've done. And I did a target date fund years ago. So I let the professionals figure out where to put my money because I'm not smart enough to know because I don't know what the, the hot picks will be. And uh, you'll get to where you want to be. Um, but it does take time. And you've got to have the self-discipline to understand um, you're going to have to fight a lot of emotions. And I've always said that um, money is very emotional for people. And um, that's the housing market. People are like, oh, I need a bigger house because I'm going to be trapped in my house with my kids. So I need to have my safe space to be able to go to. And, and you've got to fight that emotion. You always have to pay, take your emotions out of your financial decisions, because a lot of times when you do that, you'll make bad decisions. Well, it seems, uh, you know, you're saying discipline, but to some extent also this um, faith that the world is not going to end. 
uh, it feels like the world is ending sometimes and <laughs> you want to take your money and run. Um, yeah, well, so, Sarah, even if the world ended, you can't take the money with you anyway. That's true. So, point yeah <laughs> might as well keep investing i don't see you halls behind hearses so <laughs> right that's a fair point um what about meme stocks would anyone like to talk about dogecoin or actually maybe that's not exactly the same thing here what is the deal with those and then maybe we'll do dogecoin later um well it's funny you said that recently. I said, I, I know what, what the meme stocks that they're talking about, GameStop and, uh, you know, but I'll just use GameStop and, and well, anyway, I'm not going to call a whole lot of them, but there's a whole psychology around that. There's a whole uh, theory around Reddit and how they have uh, boosted certain stocks. And it's all based on uh, consensus. There you go. It's all based on consensus of a group. And it through that consensus, they decide that they, this is, and it's not based, and I'm just going to tell you, it is not based on fundamentals. It is based on consensus of a group. And that group is said, we like this particular stock. It becomes a very, gets a lot of momentum and it raises the value. Um, so I can't tell you yay or nay, but I'm just explaining what the, how the, how the momentum is created around mean stocks. Right, sort of like an influencer's game. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, and you know, approach those with caution. Anytime you invest in a particular stock, just because someone told you so. I mean, you think about water cooler conversation, right? People always tell you about the, about the wins oh, I invested in this stock and it, you know, tripled and, you know, and, but they never tell you about the, the ones that they lost, right? So be very cautious when you're investing in a single stock, because that is very risky. Um, and I wouldn't call that investing necessarily. I think that's more of a gamble, right? Um, so be willing and understand that you can potentially lose significant money you know, by investing in things like that. So just be cautious. Well, I'm I sure you'll both agree. If, if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. I, 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 I'm too conservative. I've worked too hard for my money. Working for a nonprofit, you don't make it done. So I'm not going to risk it in something I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have definitely. an audience question here um, asking, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies? So maybe that ties back to uh, what I brought up a moment ago. Anyone want to wade into that one? You know, there's a lot of talk about cryptocurrencies and stuff. It's it's not something that I am super comfortable with for the very same reason that Jeff just talked about. Um, they're difficult to understand and I struggle with why they are as expensive or how they have gone up in value like they have. So there isn't like an earnings component that I can tie to it, right? Like a company I can look at and say, they, met, they made X amount of money last year, and that should be one of the reasons why their stock does well or does poorly. With crypto, it feels like it's a lot more consensus, to Tracy's point, um, to use her word, um, than it is on real financial fundamentals. So I, I struggle with cryptos for that reason. Um, and I would probably put them in the same category as like meme stocks, you know, understand, buyer beware, um, know what you're getting, or at least have a good understanding of what you're getting into if you want to, if you want to play in that space. You know, I would agree with you too, uh, Sue, and as, as, as relates to crypto, crypto is a type of currency and there are all kinds of different kinds of currencies in the category of crypto. Uh, and it is, in my opinion, based on uh, consensus of, of some group. However, I do feel like there is a, a message, an underlying message there, whether it's Do Dogecoin or if it's, um, what's the other one? I, I can't think of all of them. Um, but think about opportunity, even as it relates to these mean kinds of stocks and how, this, how they create momentum how they're able to create momentum. And so the underlining mechanism to bring awareness to all these, I feel is more of the opportunity. And I'm not calling any names, but I'm just saying 
think about the whole technology and the infrastructure around creating the momentum and the consensus. And you might want to see there might be a new opportunity to think about. Hmm. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, there have been several aid packages, of course, from the federal government since the pandemic began. Um, Jeff, can you kind of review those for us and let us know how you've been advising people who come to you and how best to use those assistance funds when they when they show up? That's a great question. We basically had three separate checks and there were different amounts based on your family size, um, your income. Um, those have all been flushed out. I still get questions, when's my fourth stimulus check coming? Um, for right now, there's not a forced stimulus check coming that I've been aware of. Um, another thing that happened, so if you got that money, um, it's, it's already come to you and hopefully you've used it wisely. For people with children under the age of 17, they did do an advanced child tax credit. Um, so we're starting to see people getting that. And that's, that's a positive thing um, that I'm seeing. And, and hopefully people understand that they're getting their refunds now versus having to wait. They started it in July. Um, so based on your child's age and how many children you have, you should be already getting that money. If you're not, you need to, to go to irs.gov um, to sign up and to also try to find, up, find out why you're not getting it. Although I'm not gonna lie, getting hold of the IRS right now is almost impossible. You'll be on hold for quite a while. So we're advising people to use that money if you don't need it. Um, to set it aside for emergencies, because as most people know, if you don't have money for emergencies, and I tell you, emergencies in the 25 years that I've been doing this job have really changed, because it's very mm -hmm. expensive to for medical, um, for car repairs, so you've got to get that money set aside for emergencies, so I'm trying to coach people into setting that extra money that they're getting now monthly um, into that emergency fund, because it will happen. You know, I just yesterday slipped and fell and I'm probably going to have to have finger surgery now. Um, so I'm scared to see how much out of pocket that's going to be, but it's going to be way more than I had anticipated. So it, it happens to me. I know it happens to everybody else. So use those stimulus monies to try to protect yourself so you don't have to turn to high interest loans. Um, so that's, that's what I'm encouraging. Will there be a fourth check? I don't think so, but I don't know what Congress will pass. Who knows? So... Um, please protect yourselves because, you know, nobody cares more about your situation than you do. And, and if you don't protect yourself, nobody will. Hmm. Um, regarding student debt, this is an audience question I have here. Uh, even though there are no interests, uh, there's no interest on it right now, is it still beneficial to pay it off as soon as possible? Or uh, would you recommend people kind of switch tactics to pay something else off first? Or, or what do you advise people to do? You mind do? if I take that one? Cause that's yes, yes. my wheelhouse. Yes. The student loan debt is deferred until December. There's a lot of politics going on as we all know. This is what I'm advising because it's 0% interest right now. So if you don't have other high interest debt that you wanna to try to pay on, and that's something I should have addressed earlier. That's another reason people are doing better financially is because if they had student loan debt, they don't have to make payments. Here's what I'm recommending, because I do not know what Congress will do. If they excuse some or all of your student loan debt, I am not confident that they'll refund your money if you did the, the prudent thing and tried to pay it down at 0% interest, which I would normally recommend. So if you do have other debt to pay down, I'd rather see you do that. The other thing I'm saying, if you don't need to pay that debt down, open up a savings account and just put that money into it until we get a better direction on what's going to happen. And hopefully it will be addressed in December. So that way the money's sitting there. So if they do go back to the old rules and you have 6% interest student loan debt, then you can just throw a chunk of change at it right now. Um, because like I said, I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen. There's we have become so political in this country and there's pressure from both sides. Um, it's, I don't, know what, I don't know what's gonna happen. So protect yourself first, like I said. So set the money aside if you don't have other debt that you can uh, need to address right now. And also put it into an emergency fund as, as well. Um, because that's a great question. I've gotten that question so many times. Um, I don't know what Congress will do. I just don't. 
thank you, Jeff. Um, now, this is a question I'd like all three of you to address. Um, what area of financial planning do you think most people could use a little more information on? Um, Tracy, will you start on this one? Well, I will say, to be honest, there is no way to give a broad stroke on what most people, everybody's case is personal. And if we were to do financial planning, I, I like Jeff and I probably Sue would agree, we want to work down on reducing your debt, you know, to, to relieve yourself up of some of the high interest debt and give you a space, give you a give ability to put stuff away, sock money away in certain pools is what we try to do. And of course, we prepare for retirement, but get yourself out of those high interest debt if you have it. So everybody's case is individual. And I would say reduce your debt. But first, when we, when we, how can we get you out of these high interest uh, debt situations? Sue, what do you think? Yeah, um, what I would add is, you know, take a moment and think about what your goals are. You know, money in and of itself is is not it you know money allows us to do things it allows us to live our lives a certain way so it's not the end it's the means to the end right so you know take a moment to actually really think about what your goals are both short term and long term because the best thing that you can do is to create a plan based on what's important to you and when you do that you are much more likely to save you're much more likely to do the hard work of paying down debt, um, you know, setting aside money for retirement or whatever your goals are. Um, so take that moment to really think about what you want um, and then start creating that action plan to, to reach those goals. Um, that's the single most important thing. I think people flounder because they think, well, I've got this and I've got this and they, they, put, they have all these different ideas in their minds, but they don't stop to prioritize um, they don't stop to think about what's truly important to them. And when you do that, then you create that clear picture in your mind of what you want to achieve. Um, so taking that moment in the beginning to really think through what that is, and it's different for everybody, right? And, and that's the beauty of financial planning. And, and you know what I love most about what I get to do is that everybody has different goals, um, and so it's thinking through what those goals are, whether it's, you know, making sure that you have enough for your kids to go to college, um, you know, to we want to retire and be able to take our kids on a vacation every other year, right? So it's all of those things of really looking at what's important to you and, and then setting those priorities accordingly. Hmm. Jeff, how about you? They're both there, spot on. They're both exactly spot on. Everybody's situation is different. Everybody has different goals. If I could plug what I do for a living, it's free of charge. I work for a consumer credit counseling service. I actually teach a class twice a month. I do it on Saturday mornings um, from 10 to noon and then a 5.30 to 7.30. And we talk exactly about that. We talk about how to set goals. Um, we talk about smart goals, how to um, think about giving them measurables so you know if you can get there. Um, being very specific on your goals. Plus, I, I give tips on saving money and day-to-day -day expenses because I found over 25 years of doing this, a lot of times people have enough income. They just kind of waste their money here and there. And I try to give them some tips on you know cheaper cell phones. I counseled a gentleman yesterday that was behind on his rent and his car payment, but he was paying $350 a month for his cell phone plan. Um, because he bought the most expensive phones. And I'm just shaking my head, you know, where are you going? You can't even live in your car because you're going to car have your car repossessed and you may be evicted. So we talked about, you know, what are the priorities? You know, keeping the roof over your head, food in your mouth, utilities on, you got to do that first. And then with what money's left over, you start attacking other situations. Mm -hmm. So um, if people are interested, just give us a call. The phone number is 265-2000. Um, I teach it on the phone if you can't attend in person or if you're worried about COVID. Um, we do do it with social distancing. It's totally free. No hidden agendas. We don't sell products or services here. I just try to give good advice and let you make your decisions. I've told people forever that, you know, everybody's an adult. You walk in with your situation and you're going to walk out with it. But hopefully I can give you some ideas to try to fix it. Okay. 
Well, thank you. Um, I want just to give you all one more opportunity and we'll kind of go around again here to share some uh, general tips for financial health. If there's any last uh, tip that you would uh, leave our audience with this evening. Um, and Tracy, we'll start with you. You know, Sarah, when I first entered this business, I was in uh, New York and I was in a big group of uh, other advisors like myself. And I heard, uh, it's like this person read in my mind, but I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Growing up in the community that I grew up in, I used to always hear this phrase, the rich get richer and the poor stay poor. And so I was in this conference and all of a sudden, just like he read my mind, he said, yeah, the rich get richer and the poor get poor, but it isn't because of access. It's because they use advisors. And so my uh, recommendation is to sit down and talk with somebody. There is always some resource out there that can help you, whether we're trying to get you, wherever the goal is, there's a resource out there. So that's my little two cents. <laughs> How do you know whether or not you're getting um, a good advisor? What are, what are like the rules of thumb for, for choosing a financial advisor? Number one, make sure your advisor hears you. I know we wanna go straight to the credentials. I have credentials, a lot of people have credentials, but does that matter if you're not able to communicate with someone? So make sure that your advisor hears you, understands what your goals are. That is key before you start looking at the numbers. Can we even relate? Are we on the same page and are we going the same way? So make sure your advisor hears you. Mm -hmm. Um, Sue, what would you like to add for last tips for, for the audience this evening? Sure, um, and thanks. I, um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is financial literacy for women. And, you know, we didn't really touch on that today, but I feel like it's very, very important. Um, as women, we tend to, you know, defer to others oftentimes for financial, you know, for our financial advice or for our um, you know, for handling our finances. And it's really, really important for women to also be uh, literate and cognizant of what's happening, um, where their money's at, what they need to do to be independent. And, you know, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be able to, you know, do a talk like this, but you should know the basics and should have a plan for yourself. And so that would be my advice because a lot of the, the, you know, it's interesting. I love to hear stories of why people do what they do. And the reason why I do what, what I do is when I was 20 years old, my aunt lost her husband and she was a widow at age 46 and she could not figure out, she didn't know anything about the family finances. And so it's so important for women in particular to, to understand financial, um, financial areas and, and to know kind of what needs to be done. You don't have to be a pro, but you at least got to have an, a basic understanding of it. So that would be the my, my two cents to leave you with. And real quick, because I have to keep the lawyers happy at my firm, let me just read a very quick disclosure that I'm required to give everyone. Um, securities are offered through Securities America, Inc., which is a member of FINRA, SIPC, Sue Terraconda, CFP, Registered Representative, Advisory services are offered through Securities America Advisors, Inc., Sue Terraconda, CFP, Investment Advisor Representative, Cordell Wealth Management, and the Securities America companies are unaffiliated. Securities America and Cordell Wealth Management, located at 7570 West 21st Street, North Suite 1050A, Wichita, Kansas 67235, are not affiliated. Securities America and its representatives do not provide tax or legal advice please consult the appropriate professional regarding your specific situation. Phew, I feel like one of those used car salesmen. So thank you so much for letting me get that out there because I have to. <laughs> Make the lawyers happy. All right. That is the best I could. <laughs> Before we wrap up tonight, Jeff, is there anything that you would like to add? Yeah, they both had good advice. The thing about finances, it's very complicated and don't be afraid to ask questions and educate yourself. It's, I didn't, I wasn't born with this knowledge. I, I gained it over study and, and time and reading. You know, I, I've always said that I don't understand why money is my niche. You know, there's a lot of things I don't do very well, but money's always kind of been something that I understand. And if you have a question, just reach out to somebody that can help, not 
not the water cooler talk, ask the experts. I mean, there's a reason we're sitting in these, in these chairs because we enjoy finance, we understand it, we like to help people. Um, I just taught a class earlier today of, of 10 people that are trying to, they're coming out of prison, they're trying to get back into the workforce and, and they're, they, they were very nervous and scared, I could tell. And so every one of them took my business card and, I, and my phone's been ringing since we've been doing this. So I know there's probably some questions. So don't, don't be scared to ask an expert. That's what we're here for. Um, and we wanna help. So, so just reach out and, and ask. Well, thank you all for such an informative discussion. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you've enjoyed our program. This Digital Democracy on Tap conversation is sponsored by Susan and Leon Mader of Mader and Associates. I'm Sarah Jane Crespo. Thanks for joining us and tell your friends and family that they can watch this conversation on our website, kmuw.org, under the events tab.